Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Matt Hicks, VP of Engineering for OpenShift, and Chris Wright, Chief of Technologies from Red Hat. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. So um, I'm Matt Hicks. I have been working on OpenShift for a while now. Um, so I wanted to take a quick poll just to understand how long, how much experience people have with it. So raise your hands if you fall in the group. I'll keep making it progressively tougher. Take your hands down as you go on. So how many people have worked with OpenShift for at least six months? Raise your hand. OK, that's good. That's a good premise. Uh, what about one year? Um, two years? Three years? That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And these guys are cheating. Um, so uh, we're getting close to six years now um, since when we started OpenShift. And it's pretty crazy going back to what we were thinking of six years ago to standing here in front of this room and seeing all of the momentum, the different organizations, what's happening in the industry. So I really appreciate that. I want to say thanks on behalf of um, especially the Red Hat team, but as well as a lot of other people working with these technologies, because it's, um, it's an exciting time. So given that, what Chris and I were going to talk with you about was the why this is an exciting time. We both have the opportunity to get to talk to hundreds of customers in various states, large ones, small ones. So we broke down the trends that we see happening, both the technology trends, some of the challenges that people are having. We're all excited about this technology, uh, but not everyone is able to apply it right now. Why is that the case? Uh, there was a note to the elections. I will be the depressing part of this, and then Chris will bring you up at the end of the conversation and talk about how we as Red Hat think about this, what we see, uh, what we're focusing on to solve the problems. But, Let's start with this. Uh, most of us, I think, are here. Um, IT is just a means to an end. We're trying to build that application for our business or for ourselves or for our company. And something that is it's pretty unique in the last couple of years is that the next generation of these ap applications that are going to win, they have to utilize dynamic infrastructure. No longer can we sort of have a great idea and build an app, and that's going to be all we need. Because user expectations of these apps scaling, never going down, being able to be borderline like artificial intelligence with recommendations, those things are at a flawless expectation. We joke sometimes like Google search never goes down, but that is the user expectation for everything these days. And it requires this combination of both the applications as well as the infrastructure. Now, this has really been driven by three technology trends that we've seen. Application architectures are changing quite a bit. Um, those of us that have been in the field for a while, we've probably built our monolithic like PLSQL applications or our massive like single instance JSP applications. But that's been slowly breaking up into more componentized views, call them microservices today. Same thing's been happening on the development process. We used to plan everything up front. We know our accuracy rates with that of waterfall. They weren't great. Um, and we're trying to adjust those to get more towards dynamic and agile processes. And then application infrastructure has changed quite a bit as well, from monolithic proprietary stacks to on-demand cloud-based infrastructure. So these are pretty big trends. We all know about them. And one of the things that is starting to link and amplify these is containers. Because container sits in the middle, and it really starts influencing all three of these and how, do you, how you would use them. Now, one of the challenges we have structurally with this is cool stuff, like why aren't we all using it, is that when we look at how IT has grown up for most companies, it's really in two separate worlds. Like we have an operational side of the world that carries pagers, keeps things running, and we have a development side of the world. And maybe they meet at our CIO, and maybe they don't. And this, the problem with it is that it's worked really, really well for a long time. And you think through like the history of IT, uh, you build muscle memory around things that work. This is a pattern that for 20 years has arguably worked well. Now, this pattern is starting to fundamentally break down because of our users. Our user base is more diverse, it's more volatile. Diverse in terms of clients, how they're going to access things, geography. Volatile in terms of five years ago, the chances of launching a great app and having 20 million users show up in the first week, generally not possible. It just wasn't going to happen. Maybe it would happen to like 0.1%. 
that's a reality for apps that launch today. If you hit that good idea, that is the user base you'll have. I think even uh, Pokemon Go will probably come up. That was roughly like their first week adoption that they had come in. So this means this separation across our groups, it doesn't work anymore. This is one of the structural things I think we have to look at connecting these. Now, to compete going forward, both development and operational alignment, as well as applications and infrastructure, um, these are a key area that we're going to have to balance across. So if you take a step back, it's pretty obvious, right? It's like, well, we have to use both groups. We have to use their talents. What actually is getting in the way? Like, we're excited about the technology. We know there are things we could apply and use with it. What keeps companies from actually applying this earlier? And so we broke this down to three areas. Again, I'm the problem guy, and then we'll bring up Chris to talk about what we are doing. So the first problem, infrastructure more likely than not is viewed as limiting your apps, which is a little crazy. You think about it, like if you own infrastructure, you own servers, they're already racked, they're accessible, this should be in the asset column, not the liability column. But more companies than not, when you talk to, they view infrastructure as holding them back. Now, why is that the case? One reason is applications' expectations for resources have changed. So that means like, if you're on the operational side, what you built your infrastructure for is probably what, not what apps need today. This creates a challenge in terms of that, that asset or what should be that asset might not be that well applied to your applications. The second challenge that we've seen talking to companies is that if we picked one area where there is almost ubiquitous investment on the operational side, it's with virtualization. Phenomenal technology lets us take you know, big iron servers and carve them up into smaller pieces. That changes the supply side of operations. They can provide more virtual machines. It never really cracked into the demand side of developers. There was a select group that knew how to take these machines and use them better, but it didn't hit the mainstream developers. So those two things leave us at odds of the infrastructure we have and what that infrastructure needs to do. So that's the infrastructure problem. The second problem we hit is that operations teams just curious, how many people here in the room, raise your hands, if you would consider yourself on the operations side of the house? OK, that's cool. That, uh, I have carried a pager before, so I speak with some empathy of, if you're on the operations side, your world is pretty challenged right now. And one of the reasons is that companies of about any size have a span across these environments. Physical environments, dare I say even like mainframes are out there and more companies than not virtual environments, private cloud environments, public cloud environments. And then some of us actually said, you know what, the public cloud will save us all. Like We're going to move everything there, and life's going to be good. Even the companies we know that have pushed very hard in terms of how much they can move there end up being multi-vendor in public clouds. So what your life as an operations person looks like is the span of environments is not going away. And so you need a way to operate in this space so that you have an abstraction point. You can apply something to all of these so that you can actually free up that time to start investing in new technologies. So this is the second challenge, is just the operational complexity is killing us. The third challenge we go through is scaling development. So it's exciting. I'm a technologist. I love learning about new technologies, and this is a good time to do it. But at the same point, if you're trying to scale development to 100,000, 10,000 person org, it's really quite overwhelming these days. Like every week you wake up and there's something new that you have to learn and apply. And if you look at the classic like development breakdown, we're still solving the same problems. Like the tools in our toolbox are largely the same, whether it's we're applying messaging techniques, clustering, batch analytics. The tools we have haven't changed all that much. But one of the things that has changed is that these tools are running across this operational span of environments. And what happens in areas like this is tools work differently depending on where your app is deployed. And this becomes pretty challenging. Clustering, I always love to use as an example because clusterings take JBoss. Uh, you use something like JGroups, it's worked forever as far as, as far as you're considered as a developer. Then you move to the public cloud and it doesn't work anymore. And you have to learn, like, well, it's dependent on this thing called multicast. And you're not a networking guy. And you have to dig in and figure out what that means. Um, but it's different. It's changed. That's not available to you anymore. And I like to use the analogy of if you were a carpenter, 
like I like woodworking. You spend a lot of time like learning how your saw works and your hammer so you don't hit your thumb. Imagine if every house you walked into, your tools worked differently. That's sort of the modern day challenge as a developer. Every place your operations team puts the app, it's going to work subtly different. Your operations teams are struggling with actually understanding all of this. They certainly know what multicast is, but they don't have the time to explain it to you. And as a developer, you have to dig in layers and layers and layers deeper when you just wanted clustering to work. So that becomes a big challenge in terms of how we scale up to large development teams, whether you're a startup trying to go from 10 to 20 people, or whether you're a Fortune 10 enterprise going from 10,000 to 20,000. So these are the challenges, but I think more exciting than that is how do we get past them? Because I've been in this space for a long time, and I think this is the best point in time where I've actually seen technology uh, solutions that I think will make a huge dent in these challenges going forward. So with that, I wanted to introduce Chris Wright, and Chris will do the more uplifting side of how we're going to solve all these. Chris. All right. Thank you, Debbie Downer. I, it's the most optimism you'll ever see from the downside of a, of a conversation here. Uh, thanks, Matt. So, um, you know, we're talking a lot about how we can bring these new tools to bear against these challenges that, that, that Matt outlined. And I think I really agree with Matt that this is a unique time in the industry where we've spent decades solving similar problems, really with similar techniques, and surprisingly having similar outcomes. And here we're really trying to take a new look at how we can solve these same problems, um, but really kind of take ourselves to the next, the next wave of, of I guess, innovation or evolution of the IT space. So um, let's take a look at some of the technologies involved. And, and this is uh, kind of a red hat view of the world. So if you look at the base, um, it's all grounded in Linux. And this is something that, as a, as a longtime Linux person, of course, we're excited about Linux has, has found yet another way to really make a huge impact on the industry. Uh, as, as you go up through this stack, you see in the middle we have OpenShift. So today we're here all about OpenShift. And it's that, that OpenShift component that brings the different technologies together. And then at the top, you're still seeing that same core Linux exposed to applications. So what we're seeing here is for the first time, we have all the technology pieces that brings together the different constituents. We've got developers that are trying to just get real work done and, and write code and put services in, into production. We have a bunch of subject matter experts that are helping um, kind of scale those development, those developer populations. And we have operations teams that now have a set of tools where we can, we can uh, combine our efforts and communicate through the tools. So let's dig in a little bit to that. The first challenge we had was uh, how can we overcome infrastructure limiting our apps? This one's obvious. Containers, 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 right? We're all excited about containers. There's only one answer. It doesn't matter what the question is. It's containers. Um, but there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we build applications and put applications into a, a, a runtime environment. And containers has, have given us uh, an awesome basic building block. That building block is both lightweight and it captures the essence of the application and its immediate dependencies without kind of carrying on the baggage of everything else in your infrastructure and dragging it down from the developer side down into the, to the operations teams. So containers is really a critical piece. And it's this notion that with containers, we can connect the application to the infrastructure um, in an intelligent way. So in the past, it's sort of been developers writing the apps and throw it over the wall, and it becomes an operations challenge of how do you figure out how to put this app into production, how to match it to the infrastructure that you've built in theory, as Matt was highlighting earlier, to support the applications. And, and if we have an impedance mismatch there, uh, you know, you're not going to have a, a successful outcome. And so this, this kind of core building block is really the beginning of bringing together applications, application sort of deployment patterns, and expressing those directly kind of programmatically into the infrastructure. With the exception of this slide, containers create consistency. Um, so 
we were looking at this earlier, and, and Matt said, well, it's Java. It's a Java problem. Java's the one, the one uh, outlier here. Um, <laughs> but but the, the concept here is with a container, you can build common images. Uh, so you can leverage some of your subject matter experts who really understand the guts of the runtime that's important to your application. Those images can be uh, moved around across all the different footprints that we've talked about and made, made uh, accessible to your developer population. So you create consistency in the runtime environment uh, because you're isolating the application and its immediate runtime from the underlying infrastructure and you're uh, allowing a set of experts to really focus their, uh, their expertise in a space that's not accessible to the entire developer population. And it's, it's this kind of container and container platform that is creating this new opportunity for us. And that's connecting the operations teams and the developer teams through a platform, through kind of a communication mechanism that allows developers to express their needs to the ops teams in ways that actually make sense. It's programmatic. We're talking largely about APIs and, and sort of aggregate application definitions in code so that that means that the infrastructure teams are building something that's just there to support those primitives and the developers can really take advantage of how do you, how do you write your application to express um, your, your resource requirements and connectivity requirements across, across this infrastructure that, that we've been building for a long time and never quite figured out how to uh, give the right level of APIs and abstraction to allow developers to, to take a more active role in the application deployment phase. And um, you hear a lot about microservices and then you hear this kind of argument back and forth in the industry of they're not really new, service-oriented architecture has been around for a long time. If you go back before, we've had object-oriented programming and we've had this promise for decades of somebody somewhere is going to write something and somebody else is going to reuse that. And it turns out that we've failed in that, in that ability to express kind of a, a high-level abstraction that's easily reusable. So we have object-oriented programs and there is some reuse within a single program. We have service-oriented architectures and to a degree we've been able to leverage reuse of those services. Here we're really just refining our view on how do we implement um, independent services that are reusable. And one of the things that I think is, is, is really a sort of a powerful display of this working. I was just recently talking to a bank in Asia Pacific and two things that were impressive to me. One, this bank went from concept to production with an application in six months. This was a container-based application, a microservices-based application. Container to production in six months. And in my experience, working with banks, uh, sorry, not container to production, concept to production. In my experience, working with banks, it's usually concept to the first exhaustive 100-page document it takes about six months. And so here, they wrote the entire application, deployed it, took that technology in a different group and reused some of the of the components that the initial group had built. And that, if that's not what we're trying to achieve here, I'm not sure what is. I mean, that to me was really impressive from um, an organization who's typically not capable of moving this quickly and, and creating code reuse. Um, just looking at how we've historically uh, allocated services to infrastructure as we provide better tooling and use a container and use a language to describe how an application fits together, we can make better use of those resources. So we're not confining a single application to a single server or a single VM uh, and hoping that somehow that service that's trapped in there is reusable because there's actually a lot more information in that VM or even bare metal server than just a single application or a single service in an application. So how do we keep um, pace? I mean, how, how can we really allow the operations teams to work efficiently in an environment where everything is changing all the time. And I think the most important piece here is providing consistency. So if you look at all of the, the, the deployment environments on the right-hand side, it's, it's varied. It's internal, bare metal. Uh, it's your virtualization, which in many enterprises, that's not an open source tool that's do, doing the virtualization. It's VMware. You have private clouds on-prem, you have public clouds off-prem. 
just building from some common building block like Linux is really a huge step forward in, in creating um, operational efficiency. And we're taking that concept here and just moving it to the next level. So we'll talk a little bit more about how a container, uh, uh, container platform or a PaaS platform creates that same kind of consistency for applications across all these footprints. But really it's how do you create efficiency for the operations team, it's consistency. And finally, um, everything is moving so quickly. I have a lot of developers, and how can I enable my developers to scale and really provide the business impact that's driving all of this? I mean, we're not building infrastructure just for fun. We're building it to run apps. We're not even building apps just for fun. We're building apps to run businesses, and more and more businesses are fundamentally about the software that they're creating. So how do you really uh, stoke that fire? See a similar picture here where now we have a, a platform layer abstraction for providing uh, developers a way to interact with all of those different infrastructures so they can really focus on building the applications and combining the different services into an aggregate application rather than trying to dig down into those details of do you know what multicast is? Should you even care as an application developer when you're trying to just get your app to cluster? And that clustering could be functional in one environment in-house uh, using uh, multicast. It could be ex uh, in your private cloud using something like Kubernetes ping to discover uh, a, component, a service in your application. Or maybe running in a, in a public cloud, you're using some DNS mechanism to uh, update DNS when you have uh, service components coming and going. And that is something that requires some operational expertise that is just burden to a developer. It's not really the developer's core competency or, or, or really interest where that, that developer's focus is on building code and helping the company differentiate itself um, in whatever market segment it's in. So this platform subtraction creates this consistency for the IT side that we talked about analogous to Linux and creates um, an abstraction for developers to work with so they can focus on their real job. And then you have organizations who are growing and scaling. And with a large number of developers, the chances are there's a relatively small number of those developers that have expertise in a key area. So let's bring those uh, subject matter experts to the forefront to help us understand key patterns. So they're going to be the, in the best position to inform your average developer in your enterprise what the best mechanism is to ensure your uh, service level agreement is met based on a deployment model of, do I do a canary deployment or a blue-green deployment? How do I ensure that I'm introducing change and, and uh, not taking a hit against my SLA? Let's let a subject matter expert define some of those uh, properties in the platform so developers, again, can really focus on, on, on what they're trying to achieve, which is write code and push code into production. So that's exactly what I was talking about here. Um, you know, again, this, this platform becomes this communication medium between all the different stakeholders across the organization um, and this relationship between experts helping the developer population scale is one example of that. So this is what we think of as the new foundation for continuous innovation. You know, we have a notion here that the world is, is speeding up and it's not really going to plateau. I mean, it's just really accelerating and part of it is because we're giving tools to people so that you can automate things and focus your energy on um, innovating and bringing new ideas. So this kind of platform is what's critical to bringing um, innovation to the forefront and this is a very Red Hat-centric view of the world. This is really the breadth of the Red Hat product portfolio. And, and besides the fact that at lunch, you can't actually get food until you can cite 12 different products on this chart, um, the point here is just to show we have a, a really broad product portfolio. And it spans from the developer side and how you build your applications to middleware and services to the infrastructure that's running the application. Uh, to management and security and a bunch of professional services. And for us, we can bring a lot of that together in the OpenShift platform. And, to, and we work with our community partners and ecosystem to really broaden this to a, 
what we are excited about as a major change in the industry. Um, so from the, the low level infrastructure, from the bottom of the stack all the way up to the top of the stack, this is a space where, where we're working together, uh, both our uh, internal developers and our community members to build out this platform and focusing both on the operations teams where the infrastructure portion of, of Red Hat's developer focus has been uh, you know, there for really a couple of decades at this point uh, up through the application layer, which we've really uh, brought to, to I think, a, a new space with, with OpenShift where we can combine different uh, middleware components and, and CI, CD kind of pipeline modern thinking around how you build and develop software all together with, with a single stack. So again, this is that picture that we started with. This is how we're bringing together all the key stakeholders. A lot of this is, is grounded in Linux and containers and container orchestration. And I'm sure we'll have no shortage of conversation about that. Uh, first one that I, sure, I could have paid you to ask that question. <laughs> so, uh, so the question, just so people can hear it, was um, is it heresy to say, like, hey, I can take my existing applications and run them on this cool new technology and platforms? And um, the conversation that I'm usually in with customers is you're going to have like a limited amount of money that you can spend on net new applications. And you have to, you know, customer call, like manufacture cash in some way. Like, how are you actually going to fund these new cool things that you do? And 99% of them are going to fund that by becoming more efficient in your existing apps. So, one of the things we have been very passionate about since we started was. We don't just want to be able to tackle the net new applications. We want to make sure that we can run that like 80 or 90% of what you have. Um, we have some customers, one customer like blows my mind that they're successful with this. They moved over 1,000 applications onto the platform. And these are not like exciting new applications. These are lift and shift and run them. Um, now, what comes with that is you're not going to like pick up an EE application that's written seven years ago, drop in an OpenShift, and then like magic happens, you're dynamically scaling. Um, but what you are doing is, Chris, I think, articulated well, as an operations team, you're building some primitives there. Like you're going to keep a core fabric running, and your dev teams can now say, like, hey, you moved my EE app over here, and I can't actually do a deployment without taking downtime. That's okay, like that's the life you live in. You get an idle change request, you can make changes every three months, like that's where most companies live. But if you put in a little investment now on this platform, uh, if you can cluster, you can scale, maybe now you can get to a canary deploy. And so we've seen customers lift and shift literally thousands of apps and then start applying patterns because now it actually makes sense to put a little investment in that app and now my change windows, I can't do it once every three months. I can do them as I see fit because I can make changes and not take downtime. And then that leads to a whole set of innovations of, okay, how do I refactor this app? How do I break it down? So that's probably my favorite topic area. And, and I, I feel like on the OpenShift side, if we are not letting you move the vast majority of your applications into the platform, we are doing something wrong in it. Um, won't fit everything. Don't come back to like an Oracle e-business suite. You want to pick it up and drop it in. But uh, but I think you know a broad swath of the space. It really really is a good candidate. Um, it was a great question too. You want to talk about the data side or? Sure. And, and I totally agree. We we talk to a lot of of customers and we can't abandon. Today net new is an insignificant fraction of what a large enterprise is doing. Um, so we cannot abandon that. And we also have to realize that. There may be components that never fit naturally into a container platform, but services immediately around those, so immediately springs to mind for me as a mainframe application, and it's probably, you probably don't have any developers that even know the COBOL that it was, the application was written in anymore, but it's well understood how the transaction process happens inside this black box and you may be surfacing it or skinning it with some services that are facing the rest of your fast-moving application in a way that kind of bridges, nicely bridges the gap. Um, on, the, on the data side, there was uh, some, some data shown at the Cloud Native Day, the end of CloudCon in Toronto, which showed adoption rates of container, containers in the enterprise 
in the kind of teen percentage rate, and uh, which was, which, you know, face value com compared to how much we hear about it feels low. If you looked a year ago, it was half that. So what you're really seeing is it's very early days, and it's it's accelerated growth. And in, in a Red Hat perspective, we see kind of similar numbers. So it's it, it, you know it's good to see it from a more kind of uh, agnostic industry view, but early days, there's no doubt that it's, it's kind of up and to the right. And um, I think part of that is it's been uh, containers and container technology have been really successful in the new application space. And so helping enterprises understand where we can bridge the gap between the traditional applications and the next gen applications is going to be critical to helping uh, at least mass wide scale enterprise adoption for containers. And I will cheat as well. I didn't see him in the audience, but uh, Will, Matt, Fairley, and Steve Watt, can you raise your hand if you're in the room? I didn't, uh... Okay, I see Will. So those two hands in the back there at least. Uh, if you have, raise your hands high so people can see it. Any data questions you guys have, whether it's from like um, data storage options we have on Kubernetes to like, can you run Spark analytics on it? Um, ask those two guys. So we'll fail the tough questions test. They will not. <laughs> so. Yes, Cormac. I know one is here. There's one. There's a couple others are hanging out. There's, there's lots of people in the room that can do that. And Ross Turk was going to come from yeah, Ceph. Yeah, I haven't seen him here yet, but there, there are going to be a lot of storage people here today. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So the question was um, basically the is the cluster type technology we talk about today is that basically becoming the new OS or the new computer that people talk to? Um, you know, I think real quick from my perspective, uh, a lot of times like computers are the things we'll talk to about the are the interfaces that people are used to um, working with. Whether it was glibc back in the day for C developers, and I think for a majority of developers, if we do things right in these communities these will become the new interfaces that they're used to interacting to. It's what you will build your applications to. As an operations team member, it's what you will be building infrastructure to serve. Um, and I do think the clustered nature of it is really critical because of that introduction. It's like you know, building applications that can only scale to a single box are, they weren't that limiting five years ago or 10 years ago, and they're crippling today. So I, I think both of those aspects are really, um, really true. Like we'll see that from the human aspect of what they identify with and the needs for your applications are really high. Yeah. Yep. I, I mean, for a while Google had a bumper sticker type thing that said my other computer is a data center. Um, <laughs> it is definitely part of our modern environment where you have really um, spiky loads, uh, unpredictable response to application, uh, you know, application development essentially. And then I, I do like to paint a picture where the, the, you have the physical hardware doesn't go away, um, but really it's about the abstraction being API focused and giving you resources that are somewhere within a data center, not just how do I get some memory from this particular box, because that's just not a scaling way to do development. Uh, my question is, the right now with our company, we have basically basically two factions in our development teams. One, it's pro container and try and working towards uh, doing that, and one that's kind of a old school, you know, with the speed of deployment of VPSs and whatnot. Want to oh, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to use containers, and they will generate a bunch of reasons why. What would you say was uh, what I can go back with as arguments as to why they we can try to get them onto the pro container side of things. Who's younger? <laughs> How Honestly, it comes How from both sides. Of, uh, uh, can you wait them out? <laughs> the <laughs> the uh, the anti container <laughs> the anti container is a split group of the the uh, experience. We'll go with the experience, gentlemen, uh, term and the uh, some of the uh, newer there. Uh, 
Um, in fact, uh, one guy that I have in particular, he's really about like, let's launch a bunch of VPSs with Erlang and we'll just use their engine. So, <laughs> Erlang OTP, I have been there. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I would say there's probably a difference between whether they're using them and whether they have to care or not. So I think there is an audience, like you'll see uh, one of the projects we deal with is, uh, we call it source to image. Because uh, there's a class of, of developers, it's not a bad thing, that they're really going to live in their source and they don't want to be, have to deal with like how do you build layers properly and how do you uh, uh, deal with deployments and how those are changing in an overlay network. And so we try to accommodate both of those groups. I would say, you know, one approach might be for the, the group that if it's, do they really not want to use it or do they just not want to have to learn it? And if it's the, I don't want to have to learn it, but I'm fine utilizing it, um, source the image and those abstractions to keep them where they're comfortable but still be able to apply common technology is pretty good. Um, those that want to learn it, we never try to put up artificial barriers. You know, it's, uh, I think one of the early things you've seen change from PaaS to now a lot of times we'll call it even container as a service today, is you can step down as many layers as you want to understand. There's very little magic um, occurring. But I don't know if... Uh, that's what I would suggest, at least. Well, the, the other thing is, I think it's important to know the limitations of technology and not oversell. So just because you could containerize something doesn't mean that's always the right answer. And you'll build a lot of credibility with the naysayers. If you can talk them through some of the benefits and maybe acknowledge in a certain situation it's not the right tool for the job, and there's, that's OK. We're not trying to reinvent the entire world containerized. Um, I mean, maybe some are, but there's, there's, it, there really are a spectrum of tools for the job, and the better we can understand each other and know what the limitations are, we can really um, put containers in the part, part of the org that really makes sense. And I mean, the VPS case feels like it could make sense, but I'm sure there's a bunch of details in there that having a real direct dialogue or meaningful technology-based dialogue, I think, without pixie dust and hype helps. Well, and, uh, I work for Red Hat, so I cover the public sector, a lot of federal agencies that are adopting um, container technologies. Um, usually when I get that question, um, it's usually from operations, and I think you know, one of the things that people don't talk about is all the benefits for operations with containers, and uh, my background, I came from the Department of Defense, and I worked for doing R&D, and I worked in operations, and you know, when something blows up on a Sunday and your, and your cell phone starts going off your pager, if you're in operations, you go in, you have to, if you're on a VM, you have to figure out what the old version of the application was. You have to undo all the middleware steps, you know, undo any configuration changes that were done to the, the guest OS or the middleware. You know, that can be a really cumbersome process. So when you're using containers, you know, you just roll back to the old version and you have that immutable image. I mean, I think that's really big for, for operations aspect. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of visibility for operations that you also get with containers. So, you know, knowing how different services are all linked together, you know, as operations, you don't really know um, or have that visibility in the traditional, you know, VM world, you know, Java developers just deploying wars or something out to Tomcat. You know, you don't really know how all those pieces are connected together. Um, but when you use a, a container platform, you have more visibility into it. You know exactly what ports are listening. You know exactly, um, you know, what services are talking to each other. So, you know, going going down those types of things with operations, I think you know, helping them see the benefits, how it can really help make their life easier is, is, uh, is really helpful as well. It's a good point. One of the slides had a header up there that said something like separation of concerns or duties. Um, and to John's point, clear separation of concern really helps both sides, whether it's the developer side or the operations side. <laughs> 